Okay. Recording. Um, thank you. As a preliminary matter, I am Tina Burgos, member of the uh, Needham Human Rights Commi Commission Committee, and I will be chairing this meeting. I'm sorry, I'm getting sick last night. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sophia? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Jen? Carrie? Amelia? Here. Belinda? Here. Ashok? Yes. Marcus? Yeah. Jared? Yes. Bud? Marlene? Here. Julie? Here. Katie? Here. Good evening. This open meeting of the Needham Human Rights Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspend the requirement of open meeting law to have all members in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting is a webinar and will allow the public to comment. For this meeting, the NHRC is convening, is convening by Zoom app as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you um, and take care not to sh screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. We are now turning to the first item in the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your, your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until I yield to the floor to you and state your name before speaking. For items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair, I will afford public comment as follows. I will first ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses only. Once I have a list of all public commentators, I will call in each name and afford three minutes for any comments. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call votes. Um, oh, Jen, hi, and Carrie, hi. Could you guys just confirm that you're here, please, for um, a recording? Jen? Hi, here, thank you, sorry. Carrie? Here. Okay, anybody else pop on while I was, okay. Um, Public participation. Tina, I'll, I'll note there's two members of the select board um, that are attendees and um, I think they were, uh, you had invited them to come watch for Drake's um, presentation. So if it's okay with you, if they raise their hands, I can bring them over um, to be on the screen or we can keep them as attendees. Yeah, they can come up, yeah. There's, there's no other um, attendees for public participation. Okay, um, let's, I'm sorry, I, I missed, I jumped around here. Uh, approval of the minutes from our last meeting. Amelia, I believe you had some modifications. Yes, I received, um, I heard from one person, it was Marlene. So what I did was 
uh, change the first paragraph um, slightly um, to use different terms. And I'll read it if it's okay. It's only three sentences. And that's the only change that I made that, that uh, comments I received. And it's under old business and it's uh, Needham Human Rights Committee complaint process. The committee reviewed its recommendation to the select board to oversee a complaint process program in the Needham community. The committee cannot move forward until the select board further clarifies the charge and responsibilities of the Needham Human Rights Committee. Marlene shared that many human rights committee committees have this role. So it, it basically says the same thing, but I reworded it uh, to sound better. So that is the only change in the minutes that you received. Okay. Does anybody else have any changes that they want made? Can I have a motion to, is this how it works? Yo, Marlene. I move to accept the minutes as presented. I second. Okay. Uh, Sophia, uh, yes. When I call your name, please respond um, yes or no regarding approval of the minutes. Sophia? Yes. Cynthia? Cynthia, you're on mute. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Jen? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Amelia? Yes. Ashok? Yes. Marcus? Yes. Jared? Yes. Marlene? Yes. Julie? Yes. And I am a yes, so the meeting, um, minutes of the last meeting have been approved from January 21st. Amelia? Would you like me to send the, the uh, uh, revised minutes so you don't have to do it to Sandy and um, the appropriate sources? Oh, yeah, that would be great. Thank you. There's Bud. No. Hi. OK. Um, Marlene. If we could move on now to uh, Drake, yes. um, you had mentioned that you would be yeah, I would just, to yeah. provide I would, the introduction. Yeah, I just wanted to welcome Drake. Um, we've just met one time. Um, Drake is the co-chair of the Arlington Human Rights Committee. And as many of you know, I used to be on the Arlington Human Rights Committee at one point. Um, I didn't know Drake then, but was impressed with their um, complaint process at the time. And I was a participant and um, listened to and, I don't know, adjudicated uh, complaints. And they have since, I think, really uh, beefed it up the whole protocol. And so I invited him to come present to us tonight so we could hear what they're doing and think about um, how that might work for Needham. So Drake, take it away. Great. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, if you will let me share my screen, I will try to do that. I apologize in advance. My computer has on occasion failed um, when I'm trying to share my screen. So we're just going to Hope it works for as long as it does. Um, the Arlington Human Rights Commission was founded in 1993 and we have 13 seats. Uh, I joined in November of 2019 and we had about, we had 12 seats filled. We didn't fill the 13th seat um, as long as I've been there until this January. So now we're at full force um, and uh, I was elected one of the co-chairs um, in January for this calendar year. And I begged my other co-chair to read the, uh, as a preliminary matter, scroll um, for our first meeting this month because it is very long um, and a lot of work. Um, let me see if I can. Uh... Get these slides to advance. So I'm gonna start, um, in the in the bylaws, which is not at all exciting, but I just wanted to let you know where our process comes from. And then I'll get into, we revamped the process uh, last year to make sure it had, it covered all the essentially customer service 
um, types of considerations um, towards the complainants. Um, and I'll, I'll walk through that in a bit. But um, the bylaw that created this uh, commission involved a town policy that is basically a big long sentence with a lot of lists in it about um, unlawful to interfere, threaten, or subject an individual to coercion or intimidation um, in a variety of places for a variety of reasons. All the protected classes are in here. Um, and so this is uh, what we are supposed to help accomplish. And the ways that we're supposed to implement this are responding to complaints and initiating investigations. Those are the two main um, ways the commission is supposed to help. Um, and we have a list of functions, powers, and duties. And this one we do perform regularly, receiving and investigating complaints um, and initiating our own complaints. We actually don't do that as often. Usually we respond to complaints from outside. Um, and then we have some other functions and powers and duties that we have not performed at least since I've been on the commission. One is um, mediation to resolve complaints. And one is holding hearings and ministering oaths and things like that. We explicitly do not have subpoena power, um, but apparently we have the power to hold hearings. Although um, as long as I've been there, we've never done that. I um, mean, we have been having discussions about, you know, should we be, uh, you know, stretching our power, should we be, you know, using our powers more or should we write them out of the bylaws since we're not using them? Generally, um, I think the consensus is there's no reason to write them out. Um, you know, we used to have some professional people with professional mediation um, experience. Now we don't. So maybe we should get some training, certainly before we try to do it. Um, but these are in the bylaws in case we decide um, they're necessary. And then in the bylaws, there is a complaint resolution procedure. I deliberately made it illegible because when you read it, your eyes glaze over. Um, and we're not going to tell new commissioners, you know, reference this whenever you need to know. Um, I put the link in, I can send you the PDF um, later and you can, you know, find it on the town website. But what we needed to do was close the gap um, and, and document a human process. And the reason we really needed to document this, are you able to see, are we on slide nine? Okay, good. Um, technology is working. Um, it's very important for us to document it because we assign a one commissioner every month to take the incidents for that month. Um, if we get a deluge, the co-chairs will triage and bring other people on, but each month, the commissioners have to be consistent. When commission members change, we need to be able to train new ones in the same process. We have to be objective. And I think it's very important for um, the commission's processes to be transparent so that uh, the community knows what to expect and doesn't start suspecting that we do things differently for different people. Um, pretty obvious. Um, but when we got to guiding principles, some of these were not really written down. And last year we started to emphasize that A, we have to be responsive. Um, we, we can't leave things, you know, and sort of disappear. We have to, there, it's customer service, right? We have to be responsive. We have to show empathy. Um, the complaints aren't always going to be um, very well founded, but the way people feel is always true. So we have to show empathy to that. Um, we have to respect what they want. Uh, we are serving them to achieve the outcomes they want. Sometimes they want, um, sometimes they don't really want anything in return. They just want the town to acknowledge the issue and work on it. Um, sometimes they might want a specific apology or something. Um, and of course, we always have to respect the degree of privacy they want. Some want the issue to be known because they're trying to shed light on something and some uh, the complaint may be against a neighbor or someone that they can't get away from and so they need absolute privacy um, and some of our I'll, I'll show you later some complaints come through the police department and some come to us specifically because they do not want to involve the police department um, we 
try to connect people to professional help. I mean, we are all volunteers and I like to say that by design, it's amateur night. Um, so we definitely want to, we're, we're not the ones equipped to solve the problems for people so much as to make them heard and investigate the situation and then um, connect them to people who can help them properly. And um, this year we sort of formalized when do we step out of a situation? We're still debating, you know, what role can we play if the complaint is against a town employee? There's a little bit of a gray area there. Um, and, but we have um, a very clear idea now that once the complainant um, acquires legal counsel, that's when we step out. Once they have a lawyer professionally helping them, that person should be in charge and aware of all the issues and we should um, step out of the dynamic. Um, we are tracking incidents. We want to get better at closing the loop and tracking the outcomes. Um, and ultimately we wanna have a material impact. We don't just want um, to be someone people can just come to to be heard and have nothing happen. Um, so we, want, we definitely wanna make things happen correctly. So our whole process is designed to, to deliver on these principles. Um, the, <laughs> the ecosystem of what goes on and sort of a flow chart of the process is that there's a complainant who submits a complaint and sometimes they go through a form on our website. Uh, the town website has a downloadable sort of more official form and I wish I brought that, but it is public so you can get a hold of it. Um, and sometimes people just email us. Um, they, um, let's see, the stats were about 60% or so of our cases in 2020 came through the police department. So it was reported to the police department first, and then they recognized it as a human rights issue and brought it to our attention. Um, and then sometimes other intermediaries are involved. They might go to our Rainbow Commission first, or our Disability Commission first, or um, some town meeting member that they know who's their neighbor or something, and it may come to us. Um, but uh, all of the incoming reports or complaints go to the co-chairs, and they are uh, the sort of triage function. And then they will assess based on a few criteria I'll talk to about in a bit, and then they'll assign it to the commissioner of the month. And that person will immediately get in touch with the complainant, explain that they're on the case, and then um, address the respondent if that is part of what the complainant wants um, and, and investigate from there. Any questions so far? I'll keep going. Um, we have a basic three-phase right, process. Right. Yes? I'm sorry, can I, on that last slide quickly? Yeah. You were talking about other, other intermediaries? Yeah. Uh, like the Rainbow Coalition. Uh, how do you guys, and this is probably a more involved answer than we may have time for at this point, um, but how do the different groups coordinate with you so that everybody is sort of on the same page about the process? It is, um, what I'm told is, there used to be an ombudsman in town hall who was essentially the tell you where to go person. And that person doesn't exist anymore. And so it's been up to us to spread the word that A, we exist and B, here's the type of issues we address. Um, that is an ongoing process. And I wouldn't say we're doing a great job at it. We know that the most marginalized communities that might need our help the most are the ones that we are having the hardest time reaching. It's almost a tautology there, um, but we're working on that. And um, we do coordinate with the other commissions, the Rainbow Commission and the Disability Commission with us, we're all under the uh, DEI division in the town okay. government. And so we have um, coordinated meetings on at least a monthly basis. Okay, um, great. I believe we're the only one, I, mm, I'll have to double check on this, but I think we may be the only commission that has the sort of bylaw um, responsibility for this type of thing. Thank you. Um, no problem. So phase one is the initiation. That's 
um, the complaint coming in and getting triaged by the co-chairs. Then the assigned commissioner does the sort of investigation phase and then brings a recommendation back to the full commission for a conclusion phase. And um, here, uh, I don't know that anyone has expressed that they like these diagrams, but I made these so that above the line is the activities we do and below the line is the communications uh, we put out. And you know, maybe it should be flipped, but we Great, get the- We're still on the ecosystem. Is that the correct one to have on? No, this is what I was worried about. We should be on the next one. I'm on slide 13. Are you okay. still stuck we, on 12? We see 11. 11. Um, oh, well, that might explain. Um, all right, let's see. Sometimes mm -hmm. if you stop share and then share again, it, it will fix it. That would be nice. Let me see if that is true. All right, reset the share. Do you see a slide or do you see a black screen? Black screen so far. Mm. Um, would you, if I email this to you, is that? To Katie, yeah. I don't know if that works for um, public meeting law issues, yeah. but. Drake, um, my email is K-K-I-N-G. Okay, let me um, fire up the old email here. I don't know why this happens to me. It's very disappointing. All right, uh, K-K-I-N-G at needhamma.gov. Okay. Needhamma.gov, all right. Um, I will just quickly send this document. Um, there we go. All right, sorry about that. Um, Okay, all right, well, sent. For this, um, I see Jen has her hand up. Sorry, I was wondering if I could ask a question while we're waiting for the um, slides to go back up. Um, Drake, is the commission, do you guys consider yourself like an independent objective body or do, do you flip into like an advocacy role at, at any point when you're investigating and um, I don't know, trying to resolve the complaints that are brought to you? That's a very good question. And it is, we've debated a bunch of things because, um, you know, we had an incident in 2018 with a town employee, actually a police officer, and the way the Human Rights Commission behaved brought on a lot of criticism that we were essentially a, a town mouthpiece rubber stamping the town's work and whatever. But we, and, and, um, non-governmental activist groups think we don't go far enough. Um, we are definitely, we are objective. We are, we are, our responsibility is to issues. Um, and so we will take a stand when the issue demands a stand and we try not to take stands for or against people, I guess is, how we try to draw the line. Um, oh yeah, this works. Um, that is great. Okay, that was the ecosystem slide. Um, I, I don't know if that completely answers your question. If, if there is an issue, then um, when we get to the conclusion phase, I think we might get more to sort of a more material answer. Um, but um, this is what I was talking about. The initiation phase is basically up to the triage by the co-chairs and then the commissioner goes and does stuff and then they bring it back to the full commission with a recommendation of what to do. Um, so this slide is the above the line is sort of the activities we do and below the line is the more customer service communication we do. So we receive a complaint. Um, we, the co-chairs need to address a few things like is a town employee involved because um, that's a bit of a gray area. Is it an actual crime? And, you know, to what extent is the um, police department investigation in progress? Um, and there is a rapid response team, which is certain town leaders, certain faith leaders um, that we might call upon if it's something like um, an arson of a rabbi's house, which happened uh, a bit ago. Um, 
but if it's a more typical complaint like someone ripped up my blm lawn sign that was a lot of what happened this summer um then we don't need the rapid response team we um assign uh we we respond to the complaint quickly and say we have received your complaint we'll be assigning it to a commissioner they'll reach out to you then we assign it to a commissioner um and then on the next slide um you know we want to consider in the bylaws it says incidents have to have occurred within the last four months we sometimes get complaints that are older than that and that's fine we'll look into it um we are looking at um you know is it against a specific person or just sort of a general issue? Um, do we know who did it? Was it a crime? Is it potentially repeatable? We want to assess the danger um, and we want to understand to what extent the police are involved. Um, the next slide. Um, and our number one goals are to express that we received it, um, express empathy and um, set expectations. And then um, the assigned co-chair goes forward. So, you know, I am assigned for March and um, they get the assignment and they immediately reach out to the complainant and say, I'm on your case now. Um, talk to me more about what happened. What do you want the outcome to be? What are your privacy preferences? Um, that basic information. Um, and then they might go talk to um, sometimes there's not much they can do. Um, if a yard sign was vandalized, the police will look into it and they'll look to see if any neighbors have, you know, video doorbells or anything, see if they can get any footage. Um, sometimes it's a very private matter. Sometimes it's um, a business, a public accommodation type of issue. And we might have to go to, uh, you know, a CVS and talk to a manager about um, an employee sort of racial profiling someone and following them through the aisles, thinking they're going to be a shoplifter or something. Um, and so we, um, but we, the, the complainant's privacy preferences are job one. So within those parameters, we will, we will go investigate and talk to people, um, and try to understand what's going on. And, um, you know, we do have some people who um, are more repetitive, uh, complain repeatedly, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, but it, you know, everything has to be checked out. And oftentimes it's not that they're complainers, it's just that they are more aware, more awake to what, what um, discrimination looks like. Um, and then um, they will, during our monthly meetings, um, the, the commissioner in charge of each case will report on the cases to the commission. They may, you know, take more than a month to resolve. So they may just give an interim status report, but they will circle back, um, with the complainant as necessary to keep them apprised of progress and work towards a conclusion. Um, and the next slide, um, yeah, again, empathy, privacy, um, accountability that I'm the person who's going to be working with you, um, email addresses, phone numbers. Sometimes, um, I've definitely given out my phone number to people. Um, and, uh, if there are, if they need help, that's more professional than what we provide, we will, um, find the right contact information. Um, and if it is a real crime, we do encourage them to report to the police if they haven't already. Um, I think usually the, the, the incidents that are crimes come to us from the police. People are pretty good about reporting to the police first. Um, next slide. Um, so I think I already talked about the priorities here in terms of the privacy. Um, <laughs> definitely, uh, you know, a few obvious notes to the person for, of the month to be neutral. Um, as long as they can really, we are not, um, we're not backup for the complainant initially. We have to find out what's going on first. Our goal is to um, ensure that it doesn't happen again, right? That's the sort of lasting impact we wanna have. 
Um, we're not out to create animosity. We're trying to, sometimes people have done something they didn't even realize was wrong um, when it comes to the public accommodation type issues. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, document the process, be clear, um, make concrete recommendations when you come back to the full commission. Um, what should we be doing? There are a bunch of things. This, this list of bullets are the things in the bylaws that we are empowered to do. We can talk to people privately. We can make a public statement. If, you know, we made a statement about, um, we made a statement against discrimination against Asians when the, um, when the pandemic first happened, we had some, I think, just verbal assaults of Asian residents on our bike path. Um, and so we put out a statement about that because that was likely to be repeated and was targeting not just a person individually for individual reasons, but um, it was a bigger deal. Um, we're, we're, we can do moderation. We have not done mediation. We haven't done it. Um, we have these two admonitions and reprimands are two items in our bylaws. It's hard to tell what makes them different. Neither of them are public, so I don't see the power of them, but um, we haven't done that since I started. Um, and if it's a big deal, we'll do vigils and things. We've done um, vigils when we had our arson, we've done BLM vigils, things like that. Um, and then when the commissioner comes back, they will explain, here's what we think actually happened. Here's what the, complaint, uh, what the complainant wants. Here's what I think we should do. And then we may have motions and votes and execute on something. And then we circle back to the complainant. So we had one complainant who um, experienced, uh, was encouraged over time to finally tell the commission about a, a, a bunch of public accommodation discrimination experiences he had. And he didn't want any reparation or anything, but he wanted the town to know that the town was not perfect and this, this was a real problem out there. And so we have been working on a program um, to engage our commercial and merchant community um, to A, educate them on what, um, what public accommodation they, what the, what the expectations are and, and maybe we'll figure out a way for them to pledge to be inclusive and, and we may end up having like a, a, a window cling or something so people know this is a business that has pledged to be um, inclusive and has trained its employees accordingly. Um, we're working on something like that. Um, but we had, um, we have an annual retreat where instead of a public meeting, we get to meet as a group and discuss what our goals and um, mission is. And um, we identify these five roles we play in the community, leadership on, this, on these issues, um, informing the town about expectations and what's going on with the real situation. Uh, the governance part is this um, response process, um, connecting different groups and helping them get things done and providing comfort to people who need it. So, you know, that sort of like uh, we um, are about to issue a statement about the farmers protest in India. And, you know, does that directly affect Arlington? Not in a material sense, but we have Indian residents who are very um, worried and concerned and incensed about it. And, and so making a statement is, is part of a, a sort of leadership on the issue, um, making our voice heard, adding our voice to other voices and comforting our um, Indian residents. So we decided that was a valid thing to do. This is our sort of value statement that we put at the bottom of everything we put out um, officially. And so we're always trying to live up to that. Um, do I have one more slide that's more for sort of fun? Over the summer in 2020, we had a spate of BLM or, you know, just racist things. We had um, a bunch of KKK stickers. We had thefts and vandalisms of BLM and Love Lives Here type lawn signs. Um, there were daily vigils that were sort of BLM related and people would drive by and hurl verbal abuse at them. Um, you know, when you put it all together, it's a pretty ugly picture. I'm not saying Arlington's a horrible place to be, but um, we decided to genericize the locations to street level instead of house level and plot it on a map um, because we were thinking, how can we 
find ways to make our community make these incidents more transparent so the community knows that this problem is a real problem um and it was we i we may i think we put it in a newsletter um, maybe not in this exact form but we have it, it's interesting because you start to see clusters and it's almost like detective work but it's not it's just meant to show that you know it's easy and and comforting to be blind to what's happening but we want our community to see that these are real problems um, and as the um we 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 talked about okay there are all these groups in town some are sort of citizen activist groups and you know what are what is our role in the sort of social justice ecosystem and what made us different was purely the fact that we were official and so our access to the data and the police department and the school committee and town government was that was our sort of unique superpower and we're trying to figure out how to use that to benefit the town um, on human rights issues so that's the gist does anybody have any questions for drake jen i'm wondering drake is um i'm guessing for situations that where there's really been a, a law broken and that maybe you're recommending somebody get in touch with MCAT or something like that. Do, do the findings that your committee make have any kind of legally binding um, significance in those situations? Like, are, are you guys getting subpoenaed for documents and things like that or, or investigation um, items that you've uncovered? Not that I'm aware of. Um... I think <clears throat> like we've had, we've had confidential cases where they deliberately didn't want to involve the police. So nothing of a legal nature um, happened there until maybe they get um, private legal counsel and then we step out. Um, mm -hmm. The cases through APD, we are, our role is often, um, to, I mean, we involve, it, it's been good. Sometimes we involve ourselves because we wanna make sure that it's handled um, with the right amount of empathy. But recently the police chief has um, been very proactive in reaching out to us, like, you know, morning after of an incident to, to sort of um, loop us in. Um, and, uh, but I am not aware of any situation where we've been asked to testify or anything. Um, I don't, our, our investigations are not police work, that's for sure. Um, and then for, for like we, over the summer, if someone, if someone's BLM sign was stolen or um, vandalized, we'd give them two. Um, we'd replace it double. Um, we thought that would be fun. Um, so we try what we can, but we definitely have not, I think, um, towed the line of what our powers are. We haven't tested it. Um, we've been well within the boundaries, I think. Marlene. Greg, can you uh, give us an idea of um, sort of the, the numbers that you've been seeing in terms of complaints and um, if you can categorize them uh, or if you have categorized them in terms of, uh, you know, you gave us some examples, but yeah. I'm kind of curious if you could give us a little more information. Sure. Um, my luckily, my co-chair is a data scientist by trade, and so she's um, handling all the logging. And I, I asked her before this meeting. So in 2020, we had 52 incidents, and annually we um, go back to the APD and we um, resolve our two lists. And so this year we discovered that you know they had a few we didn't have, we had a few they didn't have, but within like three to six, either way. Um, and so we resolve it before we issue our annual report to the town. Um, and so we had 52 incidents, 34 of those came through APD first. Um, so they are the primary source, I'd say. Uh, that's why I said about 60%. Um, we had two, and you know, I think our labels are probably, we could do some better um, architecture on our labels, but two were classified as homophobic, four were classified as racial bias cases, one misogynistic case, and then the others were categorized in general as hate. 
Um, so that was lawn signs, people shouting slurs, things like that. And I don't, I don't feel like those categories are mutually exclusive. So I think we should rethink our, our labels a little, but 52 in a year was definitely up from the year before. Um, 2020 wasn't great, um, probably from the political climate and whatnot, but, um, and, you know, general stress, but hopefully it'll get better this year. Cynthia. Cynthia, you're muted. Good thing, usually. <laughs> It's amazing to see what all you're doing. And I'm, there's a lot of questions I could ask, but one in particular I'm interested in is you talked about that some, some things were referred to the rapid response network. In the meantime, you talked about sometimes things led to more of a community action, like a, a vigil or a workshop. And I'm wondering where, what that other group is, how they're related to the Human Rights Commission, and it looks like there's an, an interplay between the, the kinds of incidents that you're uh, involved with and maybe that the, this other group is. The rapid response team is actually written into our bylaws as something we're supposed to coordinate. So it's not like, um, it's not like an emergency services rapid response team that rolls in and a you know, a, a mobile command station or anything, but it's a <laughs> list of people from the town manager, chief of police, chief of the fire department. Um, we've recruited a few faith leaders to come on. Um, and we, we definitely would like um, more volunteers, I think. But this group is brought on as the minimum necessary people to coordinate a community response to something like um, most of these I don't think we've had any big ones while I've been there, but the year before I uh, was appointed, um, a rabbi's house was um, set on fire twice, right? Mm -hmm. And so they they immediately, you know, held a vigil for for something like that um, um, when the uh, George Floyd um, killing happened. We organized a vigil for that and brought in. Um, all the faith leaders. That was a, a good example of we had been reaching out to faith leaders via email, just like, hey, we're the Human Rights Commission, stay in touch, update your contact information. We got eh, a few responses. But when we actually reached out for a specific reason, like, please come help lead our interfaith candlelight vigil, we got a great response. Um, so when you ask people to actually do something, um, they respond more than just a keep in touch type of thing. Um, and then we had someone organized a back the blue rally in front of our town hall, which was like a pro police rally. And um, as much as they espoused um, positive reasons for it, when you dug into it, you would saw that some of, there was a in town uh, organizer who was the wife of a police officer. And, you know, that seems to make sense. But then when you saw the out of town organizers, um, it traced back to some groups that were labeled by the ACLU as um, hate groups, things like that. So we spoke out against that. Um, we, you know, the town couldn't, um, they didn't need a permit to do it. You know, free speech is important. So the town wasn't gonna stop it, but we, um, took it upon ourselves to at least get the counter protest to move a block down the street because we didn't want um, some kind of armed thing, bad, horrible thing to happen. So we moved, we got the main, the, the, the counter protest organized by known activists in our town. We got them to move, they were accommodating. They moved down the street, had a nice peaceful counter protest. Um, and um, and then some people from greater Boston came and held a counter protest right across the street. And so that created exactly what we didn't want, which was more media attention. We didn't want to give the back the blue protest people um, a lot of airtime. You know, we wanted to sort of um, make their thing seem small and insignificant by not having a whole counter protest next to it that looked big. Um, but it turned out peaceful. So that was good. There was, I mean, there were definitely slurs yelled at people, um, but no violence. So we sort of breathed a sigh of relief. 
So that rapid response group brought things to the Human Rights Commission, and then you worked through that group to sponsor the vigil or the response, or did it just go to, does that group's function separately? Um, community members who know we exist, which is a not a, a wonderful percentage, not as high as it should be, they came to us and told us that this event was gonna happen. And then we um, made the town aware. Um, they, some people in town may have already been aware, but we um, stepped in and really pushed to, to separate the parties. Um, and, and the police department put a lot of people on the street to keep things calm and controlled. So um, it was a team effort, but we are the ones who um, essentially just call this rapid response group together. They're essentially a group of town operators who are our mm -hmm. allies to, to make sure um, things work a certain way when we see a problem coming up. Thank you. Marlene. I just wanted to ask you when people are appointed um, to the commission, are they um, asked about taking on this role? Cause this is now it's, it's a big role. I mean, used to be also Arlington did a, a huge education piece, but are, is that a part of um, what they're interviewed about and, um, and do they have to have some type of experience or you said that you do some training of them. So is the training that you do of new com commissioners just within the committee You have other people who do the training where, you know, we, we train our own. Um, we, um, well, one thing we did last year was we formalized our commissioner job description better so that when we interview new people, there is a very specific job description and the response, this, this whole um, complaint process is part of the job description. They know it's gonna be a part of the thing. Everyone has to be a part of it. I believe in, in the past, um, there may have been times when certain commissioners enjoyed doing it or were really good at it and like they would just do it. But now everyone takes a turn. Um, and, and some months of it's, uh, if the co-chairs realize that one person's already got three cases, they'll ask someone else to come on or if there's a case that involves talking to multiple businesses, they might assign a second commissioner. I, we generally, I don't think, want um, a commissioner to go somewhere without another commissioner, right? No one should be going places alone, but during the pandemic, we haven't really been going anywhere. So, um, and the training during the pandemic has been a little less um, concrete than it should be. Um, my co-chair was the first of two commissioners who started since, um, the sort of social distancing. And so they've actually never met any of us in person. Um, I feel like we have because we see each other on Zoom all the time, but um, I keep forgetting that we haven't. Um, but we get a big binder and we're like, huh, big binder. And then, so we have to read that. Um, legal counsel comes and trains us on both the sort of public servant ethics stuff and um, the public meeting law stuff. And, you know, we make a point of, you know, you know, you cannot do chain emails and discuss things behind the scenes. Um, you can't speak for the commission without the commission having agreed and voted on things. Um, so we always caveat, you know, um, if we show up at some meeting, um, we'll say, yes, I'm a member of the Human Rights Commission, but I'm speaking on my own behalf, blah, 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 blah. So we get training like that. But when it comes time to do um, the monthly investigation, if it's someone's first time ever, the co-chairs will just watch over them a little bit. Bud? Um, what type of interaction do you have with the town's elected officials? Um, we have um, a monthly meeting with the police chief. We have a weekly meeting with the town manager. Um, we have a monthly meeting with the co-chair. The co-chairs have a monthly meeting among the three commissions. Um, we're in regular contact with our um, DEI division director. Um, she's like our go-to. Um, and we attend a lot of select board meetings when we have to bring proclamations or warrant articles. Um, recently, we've been um, before the select board a lot for um, putting up uh, Black History Month banners on uh, Mass Ave or... Um, getting uh, Columbus Day changed to 
Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and so we, we, at least a number of us are, are known to the select board. You know, I just want to flag there's two electronic hands raised, Ashok and Mo. Oh, okay, sorry. Mo? Mo, you're muted. Sorry, Ashok has had his hand up a lot longer than I have. If I could yield to That's him. That's fine. You can go ahead. All right. I, I was going to actually ask Bud's question because I wanted to know the administrative relationship between the executive side of the town and the committee. I'm very intrigued by this whole presentation, I might add. Um, so how do you relate to the executive side in terms of, is there an administrative person who oversees the work of the commission? Um, we are, the commission lives under, uh, last year we finally they finally hired a DEI coordinator who was sort of a coordinator between the Rainbow Commission, Disability Commission, and Human Rights Commission. She was, and you know, fresh out of college, dropped into this crazy job, worst year ever to, to start something like this. Did such a wonderful job. They elevated DEI to a division within the town government and made her the director. She's fantastic. Um, what is DEI, if you don't uh, Sorry, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. So it's a division under um, health and human services. Under health and human, okay. Right. And so the, the health and human services director um, was one of the people I had to interview with to become a commissioner. Um, recently, she's been so busy with pandemic-related things. Um, but the DEI division director, um, we meet with daily if we have to. Um, she's always available. Thank you. And if I could just ask one other question. Do you, we have active groups in Needham that provide vigils, for example, uh, Progressive Needham, the Clergy Association, and other citizen groups. Do you also have that in, in Arlington or is, yes. your, or is your commission the primary source of that? We, yeah, so we have, um, it's complicated and we're still trying to map it out and uh, so we're a commission. There's a Envision Arlington, which was this sort of town committee looking towards the future. And they were back in the day, they were the, they have a diversity task group. They were the ones who said, hey, Arlington should have a human rights commission. So we sort of owe our existence to their recommendation. They still exist and are trying to figure out what their role should be now that they've essentially brought on board a whole bunch of useful commissions. Um, the loudest citizens group is called Arlington Fights Racism. They were created in direct response to the um, police issue I mentioned earlier, where a police lieutenant published some columns in a, in a sort of Massachusetts uh, police, um, the Sentinel. I don't know who actually publishes that, but he, he wrote like, I'm sick of social justice warriors and we should be you know, I guess, um, you know, instead of cops getting killed on the street, we should be fighting violence with violence. And, you know, that caused a huge uproar. Right. Um, they, you know, didn't try to fire him. They tr opted for restorative justice, which didn't really work. AFR got very mad, felt very disappointed that the Human Rights Commission didn't, you know, step up and take a stand on that front. We sort of backed out of it. This was before my time. And I don't know exactly what the decision factors were. But um, since I've started, I mean, if inclusiveness is one of our fundamental principles, I feel that our role is to build as many bridges as we can and burn as few as we can. So our bridge to the police department is super important. Um, a police representative attends every one of our meetings and AFR has criticized us for doing that because they think that prevents marginalized people from feeling comfortable coming to talk to us. Um, but we don't want to exclude anyone from our meetings. That doesn't seem right. And we have made it clear that if someone needs to talk to us without police, they can let us know in advance or they can talk to us in some other, you know, we want to have as many channels as possible for people to talk to us and feel safe about it. But um, excluding people to make that happen is a gray area we don't 
we haven't felt comfortable with. All right, if I can just ask one last short question, yeah. if the chair will let me. Um, how do you deal with uh, public information uh, law with respect to or safeguarding privacy of people who are talking about very personal or different um, subjects? We, Is that an issue? Um, it's not, it has not been an issue. Um, we don't publicize the complaints we get. Um, we publicize like aggregate information, but we don't publicize names or anything. Um, and, you know, definitely some cases are more private than others, but, um, but we generally don't, um, we keep all the complainant information private. No, but I mean, are you allowed to do that under your your bylaws and, and the public information requirements? Do you, I'm sure there are protections. So I'm just curious about whether it's an issue. Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, there are people in town um, who do FOIA requests on a regular basis. I don't know if those ever get into incident information. Okay. Thank you. This is great. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Sure. Great. I have just two questions. The first one is regarding what you shared with us, the map, and you also mentioned about uh, you have a newsletter, and I'm assuming that's also put on your website. So do you need a prior permission from the town in order to and get things approved, or you are independently able to do these things? We do them independently. Um, we, uh, we issue our statements. Uh, with um, commission approval. We have uh -huh, the statement process is a whole separate document. We could talk about, we could present that for an hour, but um, we, we have a, another co-chair triage process where if we, um, if a commissioner raises um, a need to make a statement, we will, the, com the co-chairs will decide, okay, does this need to be so timely that it can't wait for a vote in the next monthly meeting? If so, we'll just tell the commission that we're drafting a statement. And if anyone complains, then we'll bring it to the full vote. Otherwise we'll pick people to draft it. And then we'll, you know, basically approvals delegated to the co-chairs. If it's not a time issue, then we will draft the statement and have the whole commission vote at the next monthly meeting. Um, and we do that without any town oversight. Um, our website is run by us. Um, we have a web page on the town website, but getting that change takes forever. Um, I wouldn't say there, there's no IT situation in our world that we are currently satisfied with. I'll put it that way. Our email addresses are our own. Um, there is a town general email address for the commission. That's what people write to with complaints and things. Um, but our server is sort of a, a private thing that someone's hosting on their Google Drive, um, the town website, we, there are changes we need to make. Um, it's not what it could be, I'll put it that way. We're trying to improve it this year. But the it's newsletter also is, um, the newsletter, the commission doesn't really even um, approve what goes out in the newsletter. We have working groups that are deliberately smaller than a quorum. So we have uh, a communications working group that handles social media and the newsletter. We have an events working group that does a lot of community forums and, and things like that. We have an outreach working group that proactively tries to build relationships with communities that we want to be connected to for future purposes, like no material purpose at the moment, maybe. Um, we have a rules and procedures working group that's looking at our bylaws to see if we wanna change anything for 2022. Um, we have a task group around housing, BLM, and Indigenous Peoples Day or Indigenous Peoples Issues. Um, but, you know, it's usually, um, it's less than six commissioners, so it's less than a quorum. And in most cases, we invite community volunteers to help. And the ones we get are often the same faces um, across the board, but very helpful people. And my second question is, have you come across situation where the commission disagrees with the town? And in such situation, how do you resolve the issue? Um, I think in the past, this is where we were criticized for not taking as 
much of a stanton as we should have um we are our plan for the future because i think that one caught us off guard but our plan for the future is we take a stand on issues not for or against people so if if there is if the town makes a decision um that we disagree with uh like taking the blm banner off of town hall then we will push to have it happen but we always debate what will get the best result is a loud statement the best way to get the result or is talking to people behind the scenes a better way to get the result i i'm a trying to build bridges instead of burn them and be trying to get material impact whichever way is the most effective um, and sometimes that's too quiet for the more activist organizations in town thank you marianne Greg, thank you um, for this. So one of the, you mentioned um, BLM signs and some banners in town and things like that. So there, is there a budget that the Human Rights Commission in Arlington has? And yes. how does that get planned for an, annually? We, our fiscal year is a July to June situation and our annual budget um, I'm going to assume everything's public, is like $7,500. Um, it's not huge, um, but we try to agree in the first few meetings of our budget planning cycle um, uh, how we want to generally allocate it, how much will go towards marketing or events or co-sponsoring things for other people, how much will go to signs, things like that. <clears throat> Um, but we, we sort of agree on a general breakdown. And then um, for big expenditures, we have commission votes to approve budgets for specific projects. Um, and then we recently learned more about the town's annual budgeting cycle and realized that pretty much the moment we start spending one year's budget is about the time we need to be planning for next year's budget. So we've never been... Um, proactive enough on that front to actually ask for things um, by thinking ahead. Um, and we have to maybe do better at that. Um, we also did some legal research into um, our fundraising, what we're legally allowed to do. And it sounds like we are, we are allowed to accept donations and we're allowed to give people things in return for those donations, but we are not allowed to literally sell a product like if you don't give us the money you don't get the product type of thing but we definitely have not stretched our um limitations on fundraising i personally feel like we would do good with the money so maybe we should try to fundraise more but we haven't talked about that much thank you marlene uh, I wanted to ask if um, Vision 2020 is still in existence, because it used to be when I was there, obviously we're way past 2020. Um, and that was uh, a, an important organization um, in town in terms of diversity. Uh, and the other is when I was on, there used to be a paid employee. She was paid meagerly, uh, who, was, who worked for um, the commission, um, I think four hours a week and, um, and complaints might come in and then she would send them to us. Do you still have a paid person? And if so, what part of your budget is that for? Um, right, so uh, the first question was Envision. Uh, so Vision 2020 got renamed because we had a debate. Is that, is that 2020 Vision or is that the year 2020? <laughs> and people tried to convince us it's 2020 Vision. I was like, no, it wasn't. It was, um, they renamed it Envision Arlington instead of naming it, you know, Vision 2040 and kicking the can down the road. And Vision Arlington still exists. The diversity task group still exists. Um, they have other groups that I don't completely understand, but their job is to look ahead. Um, and when it comes to um, paid people, I think the DEI coordinator is what maybe that set of paid responsibilities evolved into. Um, and for a time she was looking at the commission email address and then forwarding rel relevant emails to the co-chairs. Um, because she's so busy, we have since just gotten access to that email address and we 
have taken it off her hands. She'll still forward us stuff that she thinks is super important just so that we, we know it's there. She'll call it out to us, but we can go in and respond as the town email address ourselves and then look at the emails ourselves. And she, when she got promoted to director of a division, she got to hire a part-time administrative assistant to help her. So that person will help us like um, file the official minutes for meetings and um, do stuff like that. So there is more help than there ever has been, I guess is the answer. Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking all of this time on a Thursday night at 830. We really appreciate it. And as you can tell, we're all fascinated by what you're talking about. Um, I'm wondering, you you said that there was some, I think if I was he hearing you correctly, some kind of gray area around situations where there is a, a somebody that's employed by the town that's involved in the complaint. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is it, is it, that there's limitations on on what you can do or what you can investigate or who you have access to or in how, what what's different about those complaints i think based on the principle of if there are professional legal people involved we as amateurs step out i think part of it is if it's a town employee then it's almost an hr matter and so there are professionals involved. And so maybe we shouldn't be. Um, but we've had internal debates um, that we, we should probably ask town council specifically. But um, different people remember being told different things about, you know, do we have to recuse ourselves or are we doing it by choice? Like, but, but luckily nothing has come up in the last year or so. Um, I think next time it comes up, the first call we're going to make is to town council and be like, is this like, what, a, what is our leeway? What are we allowed to do in this situation? Because if it is a serious issue, then we would take a stand on the issue. So. I'm cognizant of the time. Um, and I had told Drake that we would just take an hour of his time. And I know that I also told Tina that um, in terms of she has some other business. So if it's okay with everybody, I would just like to thank you, Drake, very, very much. You've given us a lot to think about. And if it's okay, if people have questions, they can send them to me and I can send them to you if you're willing to. Absolutely, uh, to absolutely. I questions for us. And uh, please be sure to tell my old friends who are still on the commission, especially Sherry yep. <laughs> uh, and Nick um, and Christina that I said hello. Um, and thank you. Um, we in Needham appreciate it and we can learn so much from what you're doing. Oh, you're welcome. You, we do have some founding members still on the commission. So we have that institutional knowledge. And I really feel that the different human rights committees and commissions should talk more. Like there are a lot of wheels invented that we can share. We've, um, you know, Winthrop is starting one up. They reached out to us. Gloucester is re- starting theirs and they reached out um we've reached out to medford because they were gonna change the name of the columbus school to get rid of columbus and then they got a lot of pushback and they were maybe gonna and we're you know we were like well we don't really want to like meddle in their stuff but if they need help we we've had a lot of work about columbus day and so we could give them our historical background stuff but anyway i feel like we all have very clearly aligned social um, compasses. And so the more we can help each other, the better. So I'm happy to do it. It was great to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. Bye. Bye. Um, Marlene, that was fantastic. I feel like, especially everything that's been sort of discussed over the past week or so, we it's very, um, we're sort of, we're, we're on this the same path, right? They're just a few steps further along as, for, as far as where we wanna be. So we're definitely gonna continue the conversation going forward because I feel like it, they, he had a lot of, he, he's right, why reinvent the wheel? Um, and it was also, you know, thank you Mo and Mar Marianne for joining the meeting because I feel like it was good to get the um, perspective of the select board 
Um, so you guys have an understanding as well of what we're trying to accomplish and how we want to move forward with everything. Um, so that to be continued for sure. Uh, one of the things I had put on the agenda, it, it was really more of a discussion because it seemed like there were a lot of very strong opinions about um, not only the vigil for Marvin Henry, but sort of what came out of the um, reporting, the town reporting. So I didn't know if anybody just needed to kind of air it out, talk about it, have anything that they wanted to say with regards to um, where we, you know, where the town stands with um, the Marvin Henry incident. No. Uh, okay. Yeah. I can just say that the uh, independent report that we commissioned should be available in a matter of just a few days. So okay. we will have a, a, an independent, I think, objective view of the incident to the extent that that can be gotten by somebody who knows what they're doing with respect to police work, human rights, and civil liberties, civil rights. Because the person doing the report, as you well know, was a police officer, investigated Ferguson, and is a civil rights attorney. So uh, we're about to receive that report, I believe. So that will at least give us a lot more information about this very regretful incident. OK, thank you. Um, Jen. I just um, I've been thinking about this a lot and I'm, and I'm trying to think if there is um, if there's an opportunity for us to um, I don't know open up um, conversation in the community that's not um, I don't know that I don't know how, how to say this I mean the investigation is obviously very important for for town liability reasons, um, but it, it was very clear in, at least to me, in the vigil that there are a, a lot of really, um, a lot of people that are really suffering from the perception of what happened and that some of the, I don't know, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is, is there something that we should be bringing to the community conversation that is kind of, um, a, a more transparent conversation in, in general about um, how how implicit bias affects all of us and how um, how it impacts our, our community. I guess um, separate and apart from maybe what specifically happened to him, but how hearing about what happened to him has affected a lot of people. Uh, Jen, I, I don't want mean to interrupt without being acknowledged, but I need to correct something you said. We didn't do this because we were worried about our liability. We did the investigation because we truly want to know what happened, why it happened, and how we can fix it. And a lot of what we're learning through this process, independent of the investigation, is we have to address racism in our community and it's at every level, it's not just in an incident. But we wanted very much to know precisely why this happened and what, if anything, was done wrong or correctly so that we can make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen. It's not liability. So I, I, get, I get what you're saying, Mo, and I, I appreciate that, but I feel like that the number of times that um that somebody's proposed that we talk about this in some way, that the response has kind of consistently been, we need to wait for the report to come out. We need to wait for the report to come out. And I, and I appreciate- Yes, because there is liability involved. Right. So That's we don't I'm want saying. to engage in that while we have a potential suit, but that wasn't why we initiated the investigation. When we first heard about this, before there was a suit, we began that investigation. So I, I really do need to correct that because we are very committed to this issue. I, I know not you because are. of I'm liability. Thinking, no, I, I absolutely know you are. And I didn't mean to um, cast any dispersion on it. I'm just saying that, I, that it feels to me like we've been 
tied to not, not saying anything about it because we're waiting for the report to come out. And what I felt going to that, that vigil a week or two ago was that there was a lot of pain in the community. And as somebody that's sitting on this committee, I felt like, wow, we really are, are not fulfilling our responsibility to the community to kind of acknowledge and validate what people are, are expressing. And I agree with you on that. And that's, and it frustrates all of us. It's not just people who are not in government. It, if, it, it is, and I agree. And this will allow us to, to be able to talk about it in a freer way. But, but that's part of our, sorry to jump in, but that's part of our issue as a whole, as a community that we've been talking about this past almost two years now is that um, as a committee, this is absolutely a place where we should be jumping in to make the community as a whole know that we care and we're, we're listening and we're here um, and we can't and our hand, hands are tied because, you know, I understand that the select board can't make a statement or maybe the police department can't make a statement, but the fact that we can't is extremely frustrating as a member of this committee. I don't know if anyone else feels the same, but that's, I feel very frustrated. Well, I, I think it sort of gets to the, you know, we've been talking about the same issue for a while um, and not just about this, but about fielding complaints or where, you know, where we can, um, how do we move forward and actually be impactful. Um, and I, I do think that those are conversations that we need to continue to have. I feel like Drake was helpful in let, showing us the way, like the, it is possible, right? Um, and so, it's possible because Arlington allows it. Needham has tied our hands in so many ways. Um, and that's, I mean, that's the same frustration that Carrie's talking about and Jen is talking about. We all feel that on this committee. We feel very, very constrained. And we we've start to question why we even exist. Yep. No. Well. Uh, my takeaway from what he said, and I was very impressed with that presentation, is that that committee was established to be very autonomous. And this committee was not, and speaking for myself personally, because this needs a lot more discussion, I think going forward, we need to have an, an honest discussion, all of us, about whether or not this should be an autonomous um, activity within town government, or should it remain an advisory committee? And believe me, I hear your frustration. Um, and, and that does come from being constituted to advise. And what I heard from Arlington is that they have an independent autonomous activity. And that's very different. And I think we need to be talking about whether or not that makes sense in Needham or not, but we should be conscious of that. They are autonomous. However, it sounds like they are very much hand in hand with the select board. They have, it blew my mind. He said they have weekly meetings with the town manager. Like they're, they, they are their own commission that are, do not need sort of permission to respond to things. Right. However, they're very, very much um, in partnership with the town of Arlington for sure. I mean, that's what I got from his presentation. Well, we don't lack a desire to have a partnership with the Human Rights Commission Committee, but I think that we're tangled up in the way we've chartered this committee. And I think we need to be, we, our board needs to look at that and decide whether it makes sense to have this committee, which is frustrated in its role, be purely advisory or should it have a more meaningful role? I think there is a growing consensus that with respect to dealing with complaints, there probably is a broader role for this committee that it should be playing. Um, and in terms of emergency response or you know, the um, quick response, 
that there needs to be a structure to do that and that this committee should have a role in that. So I think we're evolving, but I, what I heard tonight was a very different structural approach to this. And I personally was very intrigued by it, but I think that needs a broader discussion and I'm open to it. I'm sure my colleagues are open to that discussion. How long, if Ian wants to how say long, anything about that or I'm not. I'm curious, well, how long would a process like that take? I mean, we've been spinning our wheels for about two years. Uh, if we were tomorrow to talk, the select board decides, okay, instead of a committee, you're a commission, how long would that take to make that happen? Or how long would a meeting have to get involved? Uh, that, I would be guessing, but it would be several months, obviously. Uh, and I don't know if it involves a charter change. I don't know if the Arlington Town Charter charters that uh, committee or the commission in Arlington or not. Somebody might be able to speak to me on that, but I'm not against looking at that. And I, I don't think my colleagues are against looking at that. We're frustrated by the fact that we've got you guys in a frustrating situation. I think we all want to get a more meaningful role for this committee. And what I heard from Arlington is they do that by having that committee have a much greater degree of autonomy than you folks have. And so that's something that we have to go back and discuss. And, I, and you, you need to know that we have lost good members who represented diverse communities because they felt that we had no power and they were not interested in staying on. Right, and I think the fundamental issue there is when this was set up, it was set up purely in an advisory role and it probably should have been done in a different way. Jen. I think that that Mo, one of the one of the things that um, that is that is tricky for me is that I, I hear what you're saying about um, us being set up as an advisory role and I think that what has felt difficult for me in the last year and a half or so is that it doesn't actually feel like that we even have the um, the space to make any kind of a, a suggestions to the board. Like it's it seems like when when something comes up that we um, that could be controversial in some in some way, that the direction that we're getting is that we can't take on that particular issue, whatever it is, or that that particular position, and so that even in our capacity as a supposed advisory role that we really aren't even giving the space to be able to make recommendations um, to the board. And that, that that in itself makes it really tough for us to have these meetings, frankly. Basically, no, no, basically I understand Jen, if Jen, I had an easy not, solution, I'd be offering it to you. I understand. But we're really not even asked for advice. Uh, you're more than welcome always to come to the board or to the town manager. You now have an administrative person who's assigned to this committee. Katie King is a very effective person. And she right, but can communicate that you want to talk to us or the whoever but, is functioning as the chair can, can come but, talk to us. But Mo, if there's, if there's an issue, when has the board come to us for advice? Um, I don't know, and I think that's a legitimate criticism, and that we that needs to change. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Amelia, I think one of the things we could do as a committee, and and uh, Tina, I I think you came up with this idea, is to look at where we are at this point in time. Um, the, the charge was done in 1995. And I've been on this committee, I think almost 10 years. And for a long time, that charge really gave us a, a sense of direction, but things have changed so dramatically in the community. If you look at all the activist groups, the Needham Diversity Initiative has taken over a major role that we had um, in terms of uh, the public forums. Um, but we, the people, um, everyone on, on the committee is well connected to the community. We serve on boards. We're actively involved in, in all of these other organizations. We co-sponsor events. We have very close ties to, 
And, and maybe we need to think uh, about how we can serve, play a role in terms of having all of these connections. I was very impressed with some of the things that Drake said today and how the commission was, was collaborating with all of the groups in town, including the rapid response uh, group. Um, so maybe one thing, one direction we might take is, is take a look at what can we do uh, best at this point in time, with all the things that are happening, uh, the Nuari uh, uh, meetings have, have been incredible. Um, I have learned so much about what we can do and where we are at uh, as a town. Um, I, I think we need to just stop the clock and, and look at where we are and, and where, how we can move forward as a committee and make those recommendations. Marianne? I was just going to observe that I think um, Zoom is a blessing and a curse, right? But one of the blessings is that the session that you had tonight uh, with Drake is recorded. And it is something absolutely that Mo and I can um, direct our colleague to take a, a look at and, and hear how it's functioning in another town. And I think that will be quite helpful to a number of them. Thank you. Um, we've got three minutes left. Uh, so I am going to process. <laughs> and um, I do appreciate Marianne and Mo being here tonight. When I'm thinking about the next meeting in March, the agenda, I will email you guys and maybe we can kind of hash it out because it's Julie. I was just going to say to Amelia's point, maybe, um, and obviously you're going to, I know you're going to be processing this, but to, for everybody to come to it, maybe with a clear thought of what our purpose, what we think our purpose should be. And it's, it's, I think it needs to be more specific. I think we need to come to it with like, we are going to really focus on this complaint process, for example, and this is what we're going to do this year. And we can let NDI take care of a lot more of the events or something like that, for example. Um, but I, if, if we're gonna move forward and have the select board start discussing, maybe changing our charter or whatever, we, we need to have that super, super detailed, clear vision, I think. I agree. And we had, as Amelia said, we had, I, we had spoken a little bit about this, um, a few of us um, in casual conversation. So, sort of when I get my head together. Uh, Bud, you're on mute. Uh, for the next meeting, I might suggest that, you know, maybe we get a whiteboard or something and start throwing up ideas. So as we're discussing things, I know we take minutes, but to just, you know, have, have ideas, you know, come from the group as to what we feel our purpose should be, what we want to do as group, as a group, and see if it fits within what the town is willing to uh, do in the way of potentially making changes. Okay, I think that's a good idea. Um, so I'll send out an email and we'll, I'll try to sort of frame it so that everybody comes to the table with some pretty concrete ideas and you have, obviously we have a few weeks to think about it um, and we can make it really a working session. I do agree that we're sort of stuck in this limbo and it doesn't necessarily make sense to move forward with any projects or agenda items if we don't really know who we are at this point um, or how we're going to be able to function as an organization so does everybody sort of seem like seem on board with that just taking a step back trying to re-steer it a little bit okay if you have any other issues or comments, obviously email me and we'll, we'll chat about it. I mean, there was, there's been a lot of information tonight. So Cynthia. Um, I think it's been extremely helpful to have Marianne and Mo with us tonight. And I understand the recording can be viewed by others, but to have their live interaction. And I don't know if the, the next meeting is may or may not be one where it will be helpful to have one of them, but I just wanted to say it feels like having been around the same number of years 
as Amelia coming into the organization where they were content to do a couple of educational programs a year, they didn't even look, we didn't even look at what our role was. And I think this is, it's kind of uncomfortable and we don't know what's gonna happen, but I think it's where we need to be. And that it's really, really helpful to, to have Marianne and Mo with us. Good to be uncomfortable right now. We're working towards something. So this is a, these are good steps and appreciate having Marianne and Mo on the call. Marianne. Um, one of the things that you could actually make a formal request to the select board for, I, I don't know exactly what the timing of meetings uh, is, but you could ask for input from the select board in advance of that conversation next month. I think that our meeting schedule aligns that it might be able to be put on our agenda to have some discussion because I know that there's several things Mo and I at least have talked about over the course of the last year that, that were ideas that we thought were options. And so maybe that would be helpful if we could uh, have that discussion. Great. Thank you. I don't know if the timing works, but. Katie, I can touch base with you on that. Yep, <laughs> I'm looking at my calendar, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll follow up with you offline when I feel confident about it. Um, does anybody else have anything about what we've been discussing? I feel like the meeting devolved a little bit and I apologize, but I also think that this was an important sort of step to, step to take. So um, I'm hoping that we can, again, move forward and figure out a way to feel that, you know, we're making a positive contribution. So we are at a little after nine. Um, the announcements are listed pretty clearly on the agenda. Um, all of the information is there. Um, one thing on future meeting uh, recorders, March 18th, is anybody able, willing to take over for Amelia that night? Thank you, Jen. Um, and so we're out till June. So uh, Bud, you're on the 15th, Ashok at May 20th, and Marcus on June 17th. If you guys need to change or reschedule for any reason, could you please just let me know so I can try to figure out um, future meeting recorders? Sure. Okay. Can I please have a motion to, um, okay, a second? So moved. So I'll move the way Okay, um, just a quick, my list. Okay. Sophia. Yes. Cynthia. Yes. Jen. Yes. Carrie. Yes. Amelia. Yes. Um, Ashok? Yes. Marcus? Yes. Jared? Yes. Bud? Yes. Marlene? Yes. Julie? Yes. Okay, I am also a yes. Thank you guys very much. It's good to Thank see you. Thank you. See you. Good night. Be well, everyone. Thank you.